Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is special guest host, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad that Mark Ellis is here today. <laughs> he is? <laughs> that he is. I guess Mark Ellis is joining us, too. <laughs> and I just got upgraded on my flight to San Francisco. Francisco tomorrow, Fantastic. or as John Campia would say, I got one ticket to paradise. <laughs> yes, I think it's two tickets to paradise. <laughs> Also, here is John Stein. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> I was reminded earlier that today is also Collider Heroes Day, so definitely stay tuned. It comes on later this afternoon. Wow, you had to get that out of the way I now. Did. I did. I forgot it I would totally forgot it. I would have forgotten. <laughs> hey, look, the guy's got a sausage growing out of his neck. Give him a break. Yeah, I don't listen to Nickelback. I listen to Dick Back. <laughs> Love it. Also, here is special guest Jeremy Johns. <laughs> Speaking of dicks, how you doing? I'm here, too. Good to be here. I love that. This is the true sausage fest right here. This right. Panel. Sausage party. Look at this. <laughs> photograph <laughs> it's sausage behind snap's face <laughs> Hey, listen, guys, one let you know we do this show live as happens every day at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And that means we got a live chat board going on. Wendy's over there monitoring it. We want to let you know near the end of the show, she's going to be calling out and giving a shout out to people who leave the funniest or most insightful comments in the chat board. So keep your eyes open for that a little bit later. But before we get into the news today, actually, you know what, Dennis? Get off your lazy ass and come on over here for a second. <laughs> I, I ain't got Dennis over here. I, Jeremy, we get out. A, we have a seat get right out. here for you. Get what do I do? Seat there for a what second. Do do? They're getting rid of the dick, by the way. Get rid of the, you know, um, milestones are frivolous things, but they're important things at the same time. And Collider Video just hit a new milestone. And I was going to do I think Dennis should tell you guys about it. Dennis, what, what milestone did... Y'all just hit here. Yeah, we kind of hinted on the other day's show, but uh, we have hit the two over 200 million views. And, yes. You know, right. yes. Right. And everyone here at this table, including John, has been a big part of that. Ashley, Wendy, Adam, and you know, Jeremy. Jeremy is the one who actually, <laughs> like, he, 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 made it all, he made it all happen. So I had zero to do with this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you can catch Jeremy on uh, Heroes later. Yes, later right. today. Again, yeah. let's make sure we not forget that later, which we are prone to do. But I just thought it was amazing. I think the, the 200 million, I still remember when we had our 100 million view party. It was amazing. And crossing 200 million is such a testament to the team here at Collider and what they've done, the leadership also, and support given by Complex Media. And of course, the leadership given by Dennis Zen here. I think it's a testament to all that. So congratulations to everybody in the room for the 200 million. Yeah, yeah all right, 200 million. Now, generally, when we have a big $100 million passing, uh, we get to talk about having a party. So I got a warm keg of Coors Light in my trunk. That's one excellent. Cent. We're on board. <laughs> let's, let's drink it in the parking lot. Okay. All right. <laughs> with proper before. planning, the 250 million view party will be insane. Yes, uh, that will be absolutely yeah. nuts. Well, listen, guys, before we get into the news that you see in the sidebar here, had a little something interesting come across our board that we're not quite sure what to make of it. Look, right now in Las Vegas, cool things always happen in Las <laughs> Vegas, there is a fashion show of some sorts going on called Magic Las Vegas. And at that fashion show, somebody found a promotional poster hung around Las Vegas which is purporting to be the first poster for the new Spider-Man Homecoming. Here's an image of what is hanging around there. Now, let me give a massive verbal asterisk to this. We don't know if this is real. We don't know how legit it is. We pulled this off our own collider.com. It's there. But Schnepp, you took a look at this thing. Let's, let's just go out on a limb just for a second. Let's right. just assume for a moment that it's real, okay? Might not be, but let's assume it for a second. What do you think about the poster as a first kind of swing at a poster for this? I think it looks cool. Yeah, I, mean, I said swing at a poster. I saw, I caught it, man. <laughs> I think uh, it, it reminds me of Spider-Man. It's a Spider-Man pose. He's upside down. Uh, you get a good look at the outfit. I think the outfit looks really cool. It's reminiscent of the Steve Ditko outfit, but it's you know teched up a little bit. It's got that Tony Stark flavor going on. So I like it as far as a first poster for Spider-Man. I think it's cool. Jeremy, what do you think about it? I it's one of these things. I have my doubts about its validity. Mm -hmm. So it was at a show, and this is the only picture of the Spider-Man Homecoming poster. First one ever. One picture online about it. I find that a little fishy. Granted, it's probably <laughs> not the demographic for comic book movies, but I do find it fishy. Um, yeah, it's it's Spider-Man hanging upside down, which is exactly what I would think a Spider-Man poster would be. It's a little on the nose. I mean, just it's Spider-Man hanging upside down. 
Um, but uh, <laughs> and that's it, you know. And so uh, I I like things that are. I mean, Amazing Spider-Man. Whatever you want to say about it, I really like the poster where he's up in the corner and it's his shadows making the Spider-Man. Mm. That was really cool. Um, uh, but we'll see what happens. If more pictures surface, then I'll 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 actually take it with. You know, a little more weight. My guess is this is this isn't the official movie poster. This is yeah. like a, an advertising or licensing type mm. poster. Well, so. I don't know if uh, the Instagram handle Fright Rags got the memo, but what happens in <laughs> Vegas is supposed to stay in <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> you don't take pictures of what goes down in <laughs> Vegas and post them for all the world to see. Spider Man clearly did not want to be seen in this position by the rest of the world just yet, or else they would have unleashed this poster. So I don't know where this thing came from. I think it's it's got more validity than that Spaceballs sequel poster we saw in the New York right, City subway yes. a couple months ago. But but I'm not ready to say this is the official poster. If it is, I think it's a pretty good first step. Though. No, no, if it is, and again, again, massive asterisk to this, we don't know that it is. But if it is, I gotta say for a first little tease, yeah. a first look, I think it's exactly what it needs to be. Hey folks, it's Spider-Man, and that's really yeah. all it needs to be. So if it's real, I think uh, I'm on board with it. All right, let's get to our first official topic of the day. All right, according to a report from Variety, the character of Cyborg, played by Ray Fisher, will be appearing alongside Ezra Miller's Flash in the upcoming DCEU standalone Flash film. Details about the size of the role are unknown at the moment. However, Variety sources claim the team up is intended to stimulate audiences' interest in the character, building toward a potential standalone Cyborg film in 2020. The Flash is directed by Rick Famuyiwa and also stars Miller and Kiersey Clements as Iris West. It begins shooting later this year in London and will open on March 16, 2018. John, what do you think about Ray Fisher Cyborg joining The Flash? It should be mentioned that reports of this happening were actually out a long time ago, but this is the first real confirmation that this is the way they're going. And I think it's really smart on two separate levels. On one level, just for the movie Flash itself, I think it's great. I think it's gonna be really cool to see him tag teamed up with Cyborg. But the second, and this is probably the most important thing, they're gonna do a Cyborg movie. They're committed to the character. You do gotta, gotta get him a little bit more introduced to the audience first, get the audience into him a little bit more so that when his solo film comes out, they'll be more on board. Because I don't know that the introduction we got to him in Batman v Superman <laughs> was an effective one. No. I think even most people who enjoyed Batman vs. Superman, I'm one of them. I know you enjoyed the ultimate cut. Mm -hmm. I think even those of us who like the film will tell you, yeah, that was kind of a really weak intro. So to see him do a movie with The Flash, get to be carried on The Flash's back a little bit at first, to get the fans on board with him, it's a great move to me. Mark, what do you think? It's indicative of the world we live in in 2016 and going into 17 and beyond when every superhero movie is not going to be a standalone, regardless of what it says on the poster. Mm. Spider-Man's not going to be. I mean, I think the last time we got a true standalone superhero movie might have been Man of Steel when there was no indication that anything else, and even that has Easter eggs of Bruce Wayne and other people right. being around in this universe. I think it makes total sense with The Flash to have Cyborg in there for the reason that John said. It's like that's a character that isn't as well known as the Flash and certainly know we're near the caliber of a Batman, a Superman, a Wonder Woman. So you need to introduce him. It's kind of like a soft landing for Cyborg mm. before we get to see him in a standalone movie. It makes perfect sense to me. And it makes me want to see the Flash even more. Yeah, sure. I would like to see them <clears throat> delve a little bit deeper into that like trauma origin that was in Batman v Superman. It was really cheaply done from one camera like, oh my God, what's happening? And then the mother box creates Cyborg. And that's not really a cool origin for me. I want to see if they are going to have Cyborg in Flash, we saw in the Justice League trailer that Flash has this kind of really cool studio with all these cameras and he might be a scientist himself in the movie version. So maybe he's already friends with Cyborg and he's like trying to figure out what exactly happened, what's up with the mother box that might open up that whole kind of multiverse Flashpoint Flash, you know, versus Flash. Uh, I like the idea of a buddy film with those two characters in it. So I'm glad that they're going forward with it. Jeremy. Yeah, in the, you said buddy film. I think it's a good idea that if you're going to be buddies with somebody uh, and have that pack to delete your hard drive when you die so nobody finds out <laughs> you're really, really like dirty shit, have it be the guy who can clearly hack your laptop <laughs> from anywhere. Uh, but I, I, I do too. I, I think this is a good move because I think Cyborg is such a cool character who deserves his own standalone movie, deserves a good introduction, but no one really, he's never in the forefront, you know? Right. And so it's uh, even in the uh, Jeff Johns Justice League, they introduce Cyborg in there. They do his origin story, but as they're incorporating everybody, so he's kind of like in the mix of it. Right. I think it's, it's the right step to lead to a Cyborg standalone, absolutely. 
All right, what's next? Starring together in Talladega Nights and Step Brothers, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley are now reteaming for another Sony Pictures comedy. According to a report from Deadline, the duo will star in Holmes and Watson, with Get Hard director Aton Cohen directing from a script he wrote that is a comedic take on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Ferrell will play Holmes and Riley will play his faithful wingman, Watson. The plan now is to go into production right after Thanksgiving, which means we could see Holmes and Watson hit theaters sometime next year. Mark, what do you think about a comedic take on Sherlock Holmes starring Will Ferrell and John C. Riley? I absolutely love it. I cannot <laughs> be more excited about this news. And yes, there's certainly pitfalls to be aware of where especially somebody like Will Ferrell, the last couple comedies he's made haven't been as funny as what his previous efforts are. But two of those great previous efforts were with John C. Riley. And Step Brothers is a movie that every time I see it, it gets funnier and funnier to me. I'm dying to see those guys on screen together in any form. So if you want to put them with Sherlock Holmes and Watson, those classic characters, a different spin on it. I can't say no to this. I love the idea. Jeremy. Well, I'm going to, I don't want to say I want to go to the opposite <laughs> spectrum of you, but I can, I can only be uh, skeptical about this. I love the Sherlock Holmes, uh, the BBC series with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. It is the best rendition of Sherlock Holmes I have ever seen in my life. And so, and then they have the uh, the Robert Downey Jr. ones, and they have another one. Elementary. The, uh, the, the, yeah, elementary. The, they have zero cool from hackers to in Sherlock <laughs> yeah. Holmes. So, I mean, where do you go from here except to do a comedy? So I get why it's happening, but I'm going to remain forever skeptical in, until I at least see a trailer for it. So that's the way I'm going to do it. I am totally on board with this for two reasons. Number one, still. Step Brothers. That's all I need. Talladega Nights is real good too, but I, I just adore, I can't get enough Step Brothers. I can literally watch that movie. Me and Anne can sit down and watch that movie every month and we will just laugh nice. our fool asses off at it the entire time. I actually think this is my favorite comedy duo working in Hollywood right now. I think these two guys, when they're together, something special mm. happens. Riley has a way of elevating Will Ferrell. Like usually Will Ferrell goes into a comedy and he's carrying the other guys on his back. Riley, for whatever Whatever reason their chemistry he elevates Farrell and Farrell elevates him and that works great but the other reason I'm really excited about this too is this this will not be the first crack at a true comedy with Sherlock Holmes Sir Ben Kingsley Michael Caine without a clue where Ben Kingsley played Watson and it turns out Watson was actually the real brains of the operation yeah. and Michael Caine was just an actor to play the role mm. of Sherlock Holmes I love that movie for them to take another crack at a comedy at this, I think is wonderful. I'm totally on board. I thought the most recent Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes was a comedy. It just misfired. Um, I'm, I'm, I like the first one. Yeah, I mean, you know, the first one was just it was just overblown. I, I'm with Jeremy. I love the Benedict Cumberbatch uh, Sherlock series. I think that's great. Um, we've got a lot of Sherlock Holmes going on right now, right. so um, it's high time they make fun of it. Uh, my my actual stepbrother, John C. Riley. A lot of people always say that. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that he's teaming up with uh, with. Farrell, you're right. They have a great chemistry, and I think it's a yin yang situation. So um, I'm not going to sell it until I see the trailer. Something else to consider is also going to be who's going to be playing the villain because the villain is always so important in any Sherlock Holmes right. story, and it's such it, it's such fertile material for more comedy based on who is going to be going against Holmes and. Well, Watson. it's got to be Moriarty, but who plays yeah. Moriarty? Zach Galifianakis is Moriarty. <laughs> Moriarty, yeah. wow. genius! Yeah. I'm totally on board. All right, guys, listen. It's time for that part of the show that we call buy or sell. Here's how it works. Ashley is going to read off a bunch of other items in the world of movie news, and then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to a report from Deadline, Hamilton creator Lin-Manuel Miranda and legendary Disney songwriter Alan Menken will team up to write the music for the Disney live-action remake of The Little Mermaid. The plan is for the soundtrack to be a mix of new music and pre-existing songs from the animated classic, which Menken co-composed. For Miranda, this continues his relationship with Disney, who has previously worked on the music for the studio's upcoming Moana and will soon star in Rob Marshall's Mary Poppins reboot alongside Emily Blunt and Meryl Streep. A release date for The Little Mermaid has not been set. Schnepp, do you buy or sell Lin-Manuel Miranda supervising the live-action Little Mermaid remake with Alan Menken? I buy them printing money. It's just <laughs> literally just it's like, uh, do you like money? Here. Here's a lot of it. It's a, yeah, it's a no-brainer. I mean, everybody loves The Little Mermaid. Why don't you write some new songs for it? Money. <laughs> Mark. But they're not all new songs, which is why I will buy it, because you want to have the classic hallmarks of The Little Mermaid. Now, can I personally name one song from The Little Mermaid? No. Oh, no. Under the Sea. Got yes. one. Under the Sea. Got Kiss one. Kiss the Girl. 
I can remember, I remember that one too. Go ahead and kiss. I the thought girl. kiss the girl was that. La, 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 la. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought kiss the girl was that serial killer paradise. movie. But... <laughs> <laughs> Did that have a song? <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. Yeah. So. Uh, I do believe that the Hamilton co-creator <laughs> and Alan Menken can team up and do anything, even Schnapp's idea. So, yeah, it, it, it's a no-brainer to do this. Talent always helps raise every ship, particularly when you're talking about the Little Mermaid live-action movie, which isn't the easiest thing to pull off. So if you have some familiarity, but you also take it in a new direction, a lot like what they did with the Jurassic <laughs> World score, mm -hmm. where they took the classic hallmarks of Jurassic Park, but they infused some new life into it. If they follow that same model, I think it's going to be very successful. Hey, Liz, I was one of those guys who I was just getting sick and tired of hearing everybody talk about Hamilton. Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton. Then my wife made me sit down and watch uh, watch a musical version of it uh, on video, and uh, I'm on board. I'm on board. If they can bring that, that type of sensibility, I like the fact that they're going to try mixing some of the original pieces, because you can't do a Little Mermaid yeah. without Under the Sea. Right. You, just, you just can't. But to incorporate a little bit more music and then have some of the, one of the guys from Hamilton incorporate into that, it's it's gold. So yeah, for me, it's got to be a buy. Yeah, um, I'm gonna buy this too because uh, the Little Mermaid. Okay, I have the soundtrack to it. I obviously love the music. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I had the soundtrack when I was a kid. I'm saying I bought it within this last year. <laughs> I just think it's really. I watched the Little Mermaid recently. It's really. It's actually quite good. The musical score is good, and that's what makes me want to buy it. Is that they're going to incorporate some of the songs that I actually do love. If it was all new stuff, I'd probably sell it. But uh, the live action ones have been pretty good lately. Uh, so I'm buying this, man. This is an easy buy for me. All right, what's next? According to Variety, Captain Marvel screenwriter Nicole Perlman and Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch are in negotiations to write the live-action Pokemon movie for Legendary based around the upcoming Detective Pikachu game. The Pokemon company's longtime movie collaborator Toho will handle distribution of the film franchise in Japan, as it has done in its partnership with Legendary on the reboot for the Godzilla franchise. Perlman got her start in Marvel's writer's room penning Thor and Guardians of the Galaxy before teaming with Inside Out scribe Meg LaFauve on the upcoming Captain Marvel. A release date for the live action movie has yet to be determined. Jeremy, do you buy or sell Nicole Perlman and Alex Hirsch writing the live action Pokemon movie? Um, I think it's a it's, it's a fine team for it. Um, it was only a matter of time before Pokemon took over more of the world than it already has <laughs> after Pokemon Go came out. Um, I think that should be the live action version is actually people playing Pokemon Go. It'll be a documentary. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> and we'll all oh, just watch it. Oh, you know that's happening right oh, now. Oh, it's got to be. It's got to be. It, 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 as many game documentaries as are out there, it's only a matter of time before Pokemon Go. But, I mean, I'm kind of indifferent to this one. I'm gonna, I buy it or sell it. I'm going to flip a coin. And I'm always the optimist when I'm on the fence about things so sure yeah buy it why not pokemon go i i, I gotta <laughs> sell it i you got terrific people attached to this yes but maybe i'm so because nothing look i wake up in my house and all i get is pokemon go every <laughs> single freaking minute i'm awake because my wife's there then i come into the office and these heathens pokemon go all day yes i'm pointing at wendy if perry was in the office i'd be pointing at her too i think she's texting something nasty she's literally to me. catching pokemon right now. Right now. she's catching she's pokemon right her, now she's on her pokemon thing oh, no. right now she's, she's throwing some spitefully bam. trying to catch some kind of pokemon i i don't know i just i just, i can't picture in my head a live action Pokemon version. I'm not downtrodding on the game or the mm -hmm. animation or anything. I just, I'm having a hard time picturing in my head how something like this in live action works, even with great talent like this. I hope to eat my words. I really do. But for now, for me, it's a sell. I'm going to buy it. I mean, I'm not playing Pokemon Go, but the idea of making an interactive movie with this Detective Pikachu and making that like the next Pokemon Go, like you're with Pikachu, like right. hunting down, like playing detective literally with your phone and it somehow works as an interactive movie. I mean, that's my guess as to what they're doing. Mm. I could be totally wrong. It's just a regular film and then I'd be disappointed, but I'm buying my idea. <laughs> Mark? I have to buy it too because of Nicole Perlman, because of what yeah, she's been able totally. to bring to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which has such a deep and rich mythology. And so maybe a couple weeks ago, I would have sold this because I want Nicole Perlman to be working on properties that I care more about. About. However, I had a fan get in touch with me, a Collider fan got in touch with me after I wrote about Pokemon Go a few weeks ago. And he's like, no, look, you really have to break it down. And he sent me how, you know, storied the history of this world is and everything that goes on at Pokemon. It's not just a game. There's so much, there's so many intricate details to getting this mythology right that you need somebody who isn't just off the street writing a script. You need somebody that really cares about being able to do that in a larger universe. Nicole Perlman is clearly a great choice. So I think it's it's the perfect match. 
All right, what's next? EW has given us our first full look at the newly designed costume for Pennywise from Andy Muschietti's adaptation of the Stephen King novel It. EW was also the first to reveal the close-up of Pennywise, played by Sp Bill Skarsgård. But here we step back a little bit further to get a better look at the creature who, in the movie, takes the form of a clown and feeds on the fear of children. Emmy-winning costume designer Janie Bryan of Deadwood and Mad Men fame crafted the form-fitting suit that EW says is inspired by medieval, Renaissance, Elizabethan, and Victorian eras. The first chapter of the two-part It adaptation opens on September 8, 2017, and also stars Midnight Specials, Jaden Lieberer, and Stranger Things' Finn Wolfhard. John, do you buy or sell the first full look at Pennywise the Clown? You know, every day I kind of wish our beloved Amy Rose Eisenbach was around here in the office with us, but today in particular I wish she was here. For those of you who know, Amy Rose is terrified. I think Schnepp and I would always like torment yeah. her by sending her like the most horrifying clown pictures. Just even like childlike clown pictures. She'd be like, oh my God. Yeah, she's Just like, a regular clown entertaining children. She'd be freaked out. I remember by. once I texted her a picture once and I was standing like 10 feet from her and I watched her and I saw her open her phone and literally <laughs> drop her phone on the couch when the picture came up. <laughs> I think this looks horrifying. I think this looks great. I mean, look, yeah, I didn't want them. I mean, maybe there's some people who did, but I didn't personally want them to try to just recreate that original Money Penny. I wanted them Pennywise. Money Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Bond again the other day. I'm sorry. <laughs> like a Pennywise. I didn't want them to re just redo it and try to make it. I wanted them to go for a new look, but still a terrifying clown. I think personally that they got it. So for me, it's a big buy. Mark. I mean, I don't know what's scary, the actual clown or the creepy mist that's behind him. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm more afraid of the fog that's attacking the right. clown than the actual clown. Having said all that, I do buy this first full look at Pennywise. It's so scary. It is so creepy. The way that his pants don't really fit at all. Like, it's, he clearly <laughs> yeah, is so hell-bent on killing children that he has no yeah. time to actually get fitted by a tailor. You know, he's... <laughs> Yeah. He's not. Gonna, he was in the circus. Maybe when he was a teenager. He got a growth spurt, and he is still wearing the same threads he had 20 years ago when he probably had real dreams about being a successful clown. I, it just looks so horrifying. I, I I love seeing this image. Jeremy, speaking of clowns, yeah, here we are. Boom, Joker. Um, and I, I might bring him up in this one. Um, yeah, I buy this for sure. This I'm I'm with you. This image is terrifying. And yeah, you can't just emulate the uh the tim curry pennywise you have to do something you have to make him look a little more modern a little more new and this image alone the scowl i mean the dark colors the mist the way i attributed it because there are some people who love it and hate it there were some people who loved and hate hated heath ledger's first image if uh the old pennywise was jack nicholson's joker this is heath ledger's joker is what it looks like to me it's what mm. it reminded me of and i hope this guy scares the living shit out of myself <laughs> and everybody in this room and everybody watching Schnepp. I'm going to be the sour puss. I'm selling this image. Oh, this patchwork, patchwork looking clown is not scary to me. You, I would like to see this in full color. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see a hidden, misty clown kind of floating towards me. It, does, it just doesn't look scary to me. I mean, I, I guess I need a hobo clown, a dirty clown with some blood on his face to get me going. You got Mark, Mark Ellis. right here. <laughs> Ellis right um, here. I do like the short, the short, short, the short pants joke version, you know, I mean, but it's not scary to me. So I don't know. There's just something about it. That is not it. scary. You saw that. No. You see that walking down the street and you're like, oh, I guess I'm no, safe. No, no, no. You know what's scary <laughs> to me is I see that guy with a couple of balloons on the street corner. I'm peeing my pants. <laughs> Him just standing there like, I'm creepy, not scary. So balloons are what make the clown scary. <laughs> on, on a real street and in color, his colorful weird patchwork renaissance outfit, whatever, I just need to see it in real life with a couple of kids crying, then I might be scared. This, not scary to me. M. Night Shamhammer right now is like, balloons. <laughs> He's running that down <laughs> That's right. right now. All right, guys, listen, before we get to our rewind segment, I told you that Wendy was keeping an eye on the chat board to see what some of you guys are saying who's come up with some of the best stuff. So, Wendy, what have you come up with? Mstel uh, 54 says, Jeremy Johns, it's my daddy. <laughs> I would hey, you know, doubt it's, uh, it. it's quite possible. What can I say? I, wait, that would make her how old? Like, no, I got no play in high school. It is impossible. I don't know if you're, I think you're thinking too much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, we're moving on to the Will Ferrell and John C. Riley story. Uh, Christian Cortez says, needs a new stepbrother. It's not this. 
And mm. Jason Morella says, Evan Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> <laughs> if and they then, could uh, somehow work that line in, that would be amazing. Right? And then MK Songbird says, Sasha Baron Cohen was originally attached to Holmes and Watson movie, so I hope you return to the project and ends up playing Moriarty. And then moving on to the image of Pennywise, Doug Joseph says, I don't like the outfit. The face is awesome. The outfit belongs in a Jane Austen novel. Sell. And <laughs> yes. Juan Genesis Gomez says, he's wearing a tutu and looks creepy as F. And there you go. Oh, yeah. Thanks for your comments, guys. All right, listen, guys, it is time for us to move on to Rewind, since it is Wednesday. Talking about those films that came out in yesteryear. We're talking about 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Brought to you by our good friends at AMC Theatres. Celebrating their 10th anniversary this week. I always feel so old reading these. Snakes on a Plane! Came was out it, 10 years ago this week. Was not. Oh, was what? it really? Oh, yeah, yeah. 10 years Get ago. Get these ah, 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 yeah, planes the, off my <laughs> Also plane. coming out, tragically overshadowed by the prestige was The Illusionist came out and Trust the Man. Celebrating their 20th anniversary this week, The Island of Dr. Moreau. She's the one which uh, Mark, Eiley, Mark Riley swears by. No, it was Trust the Man that you swear by, wasn't it? Okay, there we go. And of course, the classic, A Very Brady Christmas. Schnapp, you hear about these films celebrating their anniversaries. Which ones stand out to you? 10 years ago, 20 year, years ago, She's the One, I'm the Man, whatever those films are. I never even heard of them. <laughs> I don't even know they She's even the existed. The uh, what stands out to me is The Island of Dr. Moreau. Now, that is an all-time classic weirdo film. Marlon Brando with a tiny version of himself playing dual piano. I mean, it doesn't get weirder than that. I mean, that's the one that that's really- Val Kilmer too, right? It, Val yeah. Kilmer's yeah. in it. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird film. It's uneven. I can't even say it's good, but you gotta see it. So. Yeah, the, I mean, obviously Snakes on a Plane. It is so hard to imagine that that was like 10 yeah. years ago. That is crazy. But The Illusionist, I kind of mentioned to it, like this one came out around in the same era sphere, if you will, mm -hmm. as the prestige. And the prestige, which kind of rightfully so, overshadowed The Illusionist. But it's unfortunate because The Illusionist is actually a pretty damn good little movie. Yeah. So if you get a chance to check that one out with uh, uh, Edward Norton, check that one out. It's quite good. And the other one that stands out to me is, of course, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Considered by some, you talk to a lot of people talk about 10 worst films of all time. A lot of times that, that film up. Edge, it pop up on that list. It is so strange. Yeah. It's very odd. If you haven't checked it out, uh, check that one out. Anyway, Mark, which ones of these films stand out to you? I mean, I remember seeing The Island of Dr. Moreau and just being so intrigued by the little red guy. You know, yeah. they're just hanging out on his shoulder the whole time. Like, he kept me in the film longer than I should have. Snakes on a Plane is actually what stands out because I remember it coming out and everybody loving this stupid premise. I think Snakes on a Plane is the reason why we got the Piranha movies and the reason why we have Sharknados mm. and all mm. those other things that air on sci-fi that are made jokes on purpose. Like, they're trying to make a bad B movie. Snakes on a Plane is the one to either praise or blame for that current trend that's still going on. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, with Snakes on a Plane, you know what was really funny? I remember the Oscars had this uh, thing that they did that year where they had a bunch of people behind a shadow curtain and they made shadows that kind of represented a movie poster of some sort, and they did Snakes on a Plane. And I remember yeah. thinking, like, at the Oscars they did Snakes on a Plane. That was a really weird, <laughs> yeah. unifying piece of That's film, right. I guess. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I was always a, and this goes to show you the Marvel-DC thing, that's not the first divisive thing in film ever. The Illusionist and the Prestige did divide. <laughs> I was always a Prestige guy myself. Um, but The Island of Dr. Moreau, I remember watching that in theaters and thinking it was boring, yet you couldn't take your eyes off. It was the weirdest thing. Just yeah. the costumes alone, I just thought it was fascinating. Oh, you know, so I just odd. thought it was like really cool. And then you start like, I, I was like, they made science awesome. I should probably get better grades. And there's, also, <laughs> there's an amazing documentary called Lost Souls right mm -hmm. now, all about the making of the Island of Dr. Moreau and the director being fired, Richard Stanley being fired off yeah, of it. Yeah, it's a mess. Val movie. Kilmer being a dick. You know, all this crazy <laughs> stuff that ha happened on set. Marlon Brando having insane demands and weirdness. So. All right, guys, we'll reach that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to bring up on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We've got a couple of questions pulled out. We're going to get to both of them today. So, Ashley, what do we got in the mailbag? Precious Igalo writes, hey, Collider crew, my question is, do you think a Black Widow and Winter Soldier movie could work? I personally would love to see those two characters together. It could also explore the past between the two, which was hinted at in Cap 3, and explore more of their comic book romance. I think fans would enjoy this, and you could have small cameos from Cap and Falcon, etc. Thank you for your hard work. 
You know, I, I've said this before uh, about the Black Widow character, but I, I kind of put Black Widow and Hawkeye in the same category for me. Personally, I think both of those characters work, especially Black Widow, work so well as supporting connective tissue throughout all the movies in the MCU. I, th I think you just cannot have the MCU without Black Widow in there. Yet I'm not interested in a solo Black Widow movie in the same vein that I'm not interested in a solo Hawkeye movie. That's just me. Having her team up with somebody like a Winter Soldier, that's interesting on that level. I mean, it's difficult to explore their romance. They've already kind of got a romance going with her at this point, where they're gonna go with that, with uh, Dr. Banner, or if they're gonna follow that thread at all. I don't know, they seem to make a pretty big deal out of, out of Ultron, so it would feel strange if they just, like that, suddenly dropped it. So, me personally, I would be a little bit more interested in a Widow Winter Soldier movie, but not tremendously so. So I like them, I love the way Marvel is using and leveraging both of those characters in very important ways. So I, I would like to personally keep them like that. I don't know, Schnepp, what do you think? I would love to see a Black Widow solo film. I'd like them to dial it back and not have like world ending kind of situations. Right. That's what the Avengers are there for. I think Black Widow could work perfectly as a female James Bond type of, type of a spy film, go more into the dark ops world of S.H.I.E.L.D., go into her fighting AIM, any one of those like, you know, uh, secret missions you could have all the other characters like hawkeye and supporting characters be in it but it should mainly be the black widow and just make a cool spy movie i'd love to see that yeah it's Mark. just it's a matter of how you play it because after infinity war we're gonna have a much clearer idea of where marvel's gonna go with this landscape going forward you know right. we're gonna see who survives who dies and at that point we say okay do we want a black widow movie continuing the war or do we want a black widow movie that might be a prequel that might be natasha romanoff before mm. she got involved with the avengers in the first place because there's definitely a history there that you can mine so i do want to see a black widow standalone movie in the vein that schnepp said i caught ant-man again the other night and it's such a smaller movie for being yeah. in the MCU. So something on that level where it's not, oh, it's the end of the world. There's right. multiple dimensions. We got to go protect the entire galaxy. Let's just see what's going on in like one town. You yeah. know, let's just yeah. have her like, let's just have her in a burg, a vill. Just it's see not. what's happening in that place and solve something. Yeah, it would be nice to see them reel it back to like save the girl, save the neighborhood, or like a lot of 80s films, save the community center. Like something along those lines. <laughs> you can't just save the world every single time right, because right. that you just get a lot of diminishing returns there. Anyway, Jeremy, what do you think? Emulating a lot of what you guys have already said, um, I I was I never thought Black Widow could carry her own film until Captain America Winter Soldier. And then in that film, mm. I was like, okay, now I want to see a standalone with her. And so it was kind of it kind of throws back to the fact that it's like, well, that's the movie I wanted to see a solo film with her. It only makes sense that that movie also had him so they'd team up i mean she's the spy he's the soldier it is a perfect fit but i agree with all of you guys it's like don't don't make it detrimental like a meteor is going to crash into the earth because a town floated up and now it's going to smash it like don't like, <laughs> only have, black widow can yeah, save right like, yeah, like, uh, like, yeah. have her uh yeah have her have to get the plans for something or rather or you know get this piece of information or you know, a prequel movie i I'm literally throwing out no new content from what you guys already said. <laughs> she needs, I'm self-aware of this. She needs her own Rogue One. She just needs to steal yeah. some right. plans. She's somewhere. on the yeah, mission. Right. She Absolutely. needs to be on a mission. Yeah, make it like Rogue One. Or she has to scrub his hard drive before he dies, you know? That's yeah. Yeah. So so All dirty. of my history has got to be erased. <laughs> yeah. There's some innuendo over there. I saw I saw Ashley wishing she could talk at that point. <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> All right, Brian Conroy writes, Hi, Collider Crew slash Jedi Council. Been watching you since AMC and want to thank you for making my work day go by faster. For everything we've seen and heard so far about Rogue One from the cast, crew, and trailers, nothing has been said about the Bothans stealing the Death Star plans. And since it was told in Episode 4 that many of them died stealing the plans, do you believe they will play any part in this new canon, or has the new universe eliminated them from this story? You seem really anxious, so I'm just going to let you go. I am <laughs> anxious. I do want to... Uh, all right. It was episode six where Mon Mothma said the Bothans died because they stole the plans for the second Death Star. That's where they got that information. If there are Bothans in here, it'll be something cheesy like the Bothans are like, ooh, maybe we'll steal plans next time this might happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that is episode six that had the Bothans, not episode four. Yeah, it's a common misconception. It, it totally it, is. It, it is. That's weird, but you hear it even amongst, actually, I've had conversations with hardcore Star Wars fans mm -hmm. who are wondering about the Bothans, but as Jeremy pointed out, it's a simple, straightforward thing. Many Bothans died to bring us these plans. That was actually episode six, not episode four. But it's funny, there is a fabulous, I don't know if you've seen it yet, there's a fabulous video going around on YouTube right now. It's Kylo Ren reacts oh, to the Rogue <laughs> One trailer. And it's if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's hilarious. I laugh my fool head off. Yeah. But even in that, they yeah. have Kylo Ren going, wait a minute, was the Bothans who did it? Or is that 
the second Death Star. So right. like, it's yeah. funny that they even parried it in that. So just to set the record straight, the Bothans are in Return of the Jedi, not in the first Star Wars. So it is not Bothans who steal that one. And just so I don't uh, look like too much of a dick, uh, when I was doing my video for Rogue One, there was that knee-jerk reaction. I was like, okay, the butt, wait, no. So it almost happened in my video. And uh, I would never, almost. Did, almost only counts in horseshoes and grenades, friends. Mm, not YouTube videos. It, did, it didn't work. You still look like a dick. All oh, right. <laughs> so well, I guess I'm a chub. But I said that at the beginning the of the old episode. professor with a gray beard who's like in the in the, the New Hope. He's like, here's the star, the plans of the Death Star. A direct old, hit and yeah. only a direct Must go into hit. the exhaust pipe. What? What was he talking about? He never mentioned anybody, right? He's just, he's like, yeah, here no are the plans. And These are old computer graphics. Leia, no, the plans provided by Princess Luke Luke sitting, Princess Luke sitting Luke. right next to the most negative individual in the entire meeting. That's impossible. We're going to lose. I know. Right? <laughs> I got to sit next to him. What was that guy's name? <laughs> yeah. that was, Do they have uh, an action figure of him? No, that was Wedge. That guy was Wedge, but it was a different actor. So the actor that was in that scene got recast. Because and they, he's a negative dick. <laughs> so they threw Dennis Lawson in there to ah. be Wedge the rest of the way. They tracked down the original actor somehow. I don't know. If he's still alive or dead, but he he like like he was in Star Wars for a scene playing Wedge, and then they got Dennis Lawson to play Wedge brilliantly so for the next three movies. Totally. Yes, indeed. Only guy to be there for the destruction of both Death Stars. That's right. That's so right. there you there a lot you of go. a lot of Rebel pilots claim they were there. Yeah. But it's kind of like how like eight million people say they were at Woodstock. You, right. you weren't at Woodstock. Hey, like I said, we do this show live, which means a lot of you guys can communicate to us via Twitter. Just tweet to us at Collider Video. Ashley's been over there keeping track of everything going on on the Twitter board. So Ashley, what are some people talking about there? Derek Large writes, speaking of Farrell and Riley, where's Step Brothers 2? Oh man, like, okay, look, I'm, I am a, like I said, I'm a diehard fan of Step Brothers. But I, even I think, as much as I adore and love that movie, I think to do another one would overstretch the shtick. Shtick is not a bad thing. Shtick mm -hmm. can be a very, very good thing like it was in the first Step Brothers. But I think you can overplay shtick. So, and don't get me wrong, I'll be the first in line if they do a Step Brothers 2. But if you were to ask me, I don't think they should do a Step Brothers 2. That's two. like you and I saying, you know what? We do not want anybody to bring us Krispy Kreme donuts today. <laughs> you know? No, no, no. We're not going to. We do not want Krispy Kreme. But if you put the donuts right here, they're gone. We're going to run through that box in five minutes. So it's don't like let something them get where. Cold. I mean, I guess I, I think I would prefer to see Farrell and John C. Riley try something in a different vein, which is what the Sherlock thing is. Yeah. So I would take that. But Step Brothers 2, God, that sounds tempting. Jeremy? I will say, uh, yeah, it's one of these things where not every movie needs a sequel or should have a sequel because if you get that sequel and it sucks, you have that stigma on the, yeah. on the last movie also. So it's just a safe bet to keep Step Brothers, the classic that it is among people who may or may not have had brothers. Um, my brother loves that movie, by the way, every time <laughs> I see him. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's it's the, the gamble wouldn't be worth the reward. Just keep it as one movie, You know, man. going to your point, uh, Schnepp and I were talking about these two movies the other day. The, the Robert De Niro, Billy Crystal put out an amazing comedy called Analyze This. Mm -hmm. And Analyze I, that. I just love that movie. And then they put out Analyze That. And it's awful and I now that you mentioned that mm -hmm. I, I think about it I haven't been able to go back and watch analyze this again yeah. I just haven't been able to bring myself mm -hmm. to do it because it did that to me anyway yeah, yeah. Schnapp, what, what well, do you think about this? bad sequels tend to kind of put a stink on the first original one like and it takes a while like I finally rebought the blu-ray of the matrix and there is just one movie <laughs> you know but it took me a long time to deal with that pain um, but you know what I think they should do Step Brothers 3 just skip the second that one. Would be, that would be They're really a little good. bit older, and then you, they could make reference to the sequel that no one has seen, and they can have they have a lot of fun to play in the sandbox, and and then eventually never make Step Brothers two. But then just go ahead and make Step Brothers three. I think that would be genius. and just allude to the events yeah, of Step Brothers it, two. Yeah. That would be funny. All right, Ashley, what else do we got? TJ Oliveris writes: If Andrew Garfield voiced the animated Spider Man and continued his Spidey story, would it bring more appeal to the movie? I don't think so. I mean, look, uh, it's funny. Jeremy and I were just talking about this yesterday. That, mm -hmm. And I've always said this. The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which was a major step down from that first Amazing Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield wasn't the problem. He wasn't the problem. There was lots of problems with it. He wasn't the problem. I, I totally get why Marvel, now with their partnership with Sony, they decided to reboot the character. I get it. I'm on board with it. But I also kind of would have been totally cool with it if Andrew Garfield kept coming back. But I don't think him voicing anything in the animated thing would do much for our perception of the live action stuff whatsoever. I don't know. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I mean, Spider-Man is it's one of these things where, like you said, Andrew Garfield was never the problem. I think he's a fine Spider-Man. Um, if he, if he did the voice of Spider-Man, 
people would picture Amazing Spider-Man, and they would put mm. that in there. So, in if for nothing else, it would put a stigma on the on the animation. It wouldn't fix the live action one. Uh, because the problems with the live action version are still the problems with the live action version. Making a uh, given a voice to an animation doesn't change what happened in the live action version. Mm. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't fix anything. I don't know that it would help the animation either, but I do always say that, yeah, Andrew Garfield, I thought he was a fine Peter Parker in Spider-Man. Yeah, I agree. They had to do a reboot because they wanted to go back to high school, so they yeah. had to recast yeah. Spider-Man. It had to happen. And they weren't going to make a Spider-Man 3 with Andrew Garfield. I don't think him being Spider-Man in any of the cartoons or animated series will help. Yeah, right. So. And I loved Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man, but I think that I echo y'all's sentiments. And the problem is is that it also, there's a lot of people out there who get confused because they don't pay attention to movie news stories like we do every day. So if you hear Andrew Garfield is involved in Spider-Man at all, it's like, wait, but I thought they were rebooting that. So I think it only confuses people more even though they're two separate properties, people are going to get confused if you say Andrew Garfield still has anything to do with playing Spider-Man, regardless of who that Spider-Man is. Uh, basically, what Mark just said is everyone out there has lives. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take two more quick. Ashley, what okay, do we got? Abigail writes, do you think the Harley Quinn movie could turn into a Joker and Harley mo solo movie? Um, the the number is zero, and that is the percent chance that I don't think that's going to happen. Yes, the, it's, the Harley yeah. Quinn movie is going to be a Harley and Joker film. They're going to call it, call it Harley, or they're going to call it Quinn, or they're going to call it Quinzel to be meta about it a little bit. I don't know. But I think the response they're getting from the Suicide Squad is, like, look, to me, I like the Suicide Squad, but if you take out Harley and the Joker, I don't think I like Suicide Squad at all. Mm. I love those two. I love their chemistry together. I love that evil dependency, that psychotic obsession they both seem to have with each other. I'm on board, and I think they're going to bring that into it. Look, with everything they just went through in Suicide Squad, it, this is dancing on spoiler territory, so just be warned. I'm not going to go direct, but with everything they went through in Suicide Squad to have them together, I don't think now you suddenly do a Harley Quinn movie and they're not together. Mm. So I think you're absolutely right. We will uh, get them in there. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You don't have Harley without the Joker. I think that's the reason the Joker was in Suicide Squad at all. In fact, I don't think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. That is absolutely the reason the Joker was in Suicide Squad at all, was uh, to feed into Harley Quinn's story. Because you don't get Harley Quinn. Quinn no, without, without the Joker. The Joker. It's, yeah. it, I mean, the two are, it's like an Oreo cookie with no cream. You just have a chocolate cookie. You know, it's just like, you, in order for it to be an Oreo, you need both components. Uh, so yeah, it, absolutely, Joker will be in there. Absolutely. Mark. I mean, I want her to see Branch out into other DC Ville. Like, I want to see her date like the Penguin, you know, <laughs> like like the Riddler, have a flirtation with him. But if we can't have that, yes, of course you need Harley and the Joker together. It makes so much sense. Like John said, it was the best part of Suicide Squad. But can we maybe get that shot in there too? I mean, that's always possible. And look, and I'm not, I'm not taking away from the fact that we'll probably get elements of Birds of Prey in there because that's been a lot of the talk. Mm -hmm. I just think that Joker will be a part of that. I don't know, like, Schnapp, how do you think this is going to play out? I would love to see Birds of Prey. I want to see Poison Ivy. I want to see Catwoman. I want to see a lot of different characters in the Harley Quinn movie. But definitely Joker has to be, you know, yeah. in there as well. Can and not just 10 minutes. There's a little, like, <laughs> Good 30 minutes. Can you imagine the how psychotic and cool of a love triangle can, could you have? Because for those of you who don't know, in the comics, there are sometimes romantic relationships between Harley and Poison Ivy. Mm -hmm. You you create a love triangle with the Joker, Ivy, and Harley Quinn with these performers and whoever you get to play Ivy? That could be pretty sick. I, I would not hate seeing that film, John. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're all on board. Scrub my hard drive if I die. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last question of the day. Okay, Jonathan Peck writes, with Sausage Party doing so well at the box office, Office. Could we see an R-rated Family Guy movie in the future? Well, I mean, we've been told by Seth MacFarlane that he absolutely wants to do a Family Guy movie at some point. He said he's planning on it, and he said he's absolutely going to take advantage of all the crap he can't do on television. So I, I do believe we are going to get that Family Guy movie, and when it does come, I have absolutely no doubt it'll be rated R. Schnepp? Yeah, I think it's subtitled Scrub My Hard Drive. Family Guy, <laughs> Scrub My Hard Drive. For today. It's a hard R. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, yes, we'll Mark. I would die to see this movie. I love Family Guy. It's my favorite show on TV, not named Sports Center. And they did a or they did a Family Guy movie ish. I mean, it aired on TV, but it was like a feature length film. Stewie goes to San Francisco and he tries to visit his future self. Is one of the plot lines in it? So they had done longer 
bigger Family Guy that's je- that's bigger than just the episodes. They also did the Star Wars, you know, which those ones are like hour long shows, Harvest forty four minutes, yeah. yeah, and they're hilarious. So I would love to see more Family. More Family Guy is always better in my book. Yeah, Family Guy is one of those shows. Every time I think I'm getting sick of Family Guy, like all right, I've seen enough Family Guy. I'll turn on the TV, I'll see a new episode of Family Guy, and I'll laugh hysterically. So I can't actually say I'm over Family Guy. I'd love to see it. I hope that. Uh, it's a funny thing when sometimes when people are held back because of what they can't do on television, it actually does help the clever nature of the show. It does, actually, yeah. And so I, I hope it does, just doesn't go full on, it's just not clever, it's not funny, it's just raunch for the sake of raunch. I don't find that funny, personally. Uh, but So I hope he keeps that in mind if and when he does his Family Guy movie, which will most certainly be rated R. I hope he keeps the cleverness along with uh, with everything that was in Sasha's <laughs> can, party. Can you guys imagine how long the chicken fight is going to be <laughs> <laughs> in the Family Guy movie? The movie's 90 minutes, the chicken <laughs> fight Here it is. It. Here it is. This is what will happen. It will be through the entire end credits on the side. <laughs> nice. Oh, so entire end credits on the side. I would like right. to see them just open like a full minute of just every single character swearing, just saying the most horrifying <laughs> stuff. Oh, wait, yeah. we've As, like, seen that movie. Open. That's right. I forgot. We saw that movie already. It's in theaters now. Oh, is um, that what happens? <laughs> Sausage <laughs> Party? Oh, okay. I haven't seen Sausage Party yet, so I don't know. It's well, Sausage to... Party has seen you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. But listen, the fun doesn't end on Collider Video today. We got two other amazing shows coming up later today. First of all, Top 10. Make sure you check in for that a little bit later today. But also, the newest episode of Heroes with Mr. John Schnapp is going to be up there today, too. Almost forgot to plug it, but all of us uh, up here, we got Jeremy Johns on as a special guest with Amy Dallin and John Campia, where we get extra sweaty like me right now. So I want to thank everybody who was involved in the show today. First of all, starting here, even though we just were kind of there, but we'll go there anyway. Mr. John Schnepp, where can people find you? Oh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. I thought you were going to plug Heroes again. And also you can find me later this <laughs> afternoon on a little tiny show, episode 70 of Collider Heroes. Sitting right beside me here, Mr. Mark Ellis. On Twitter and Instagram, at Mark Ellis Live, where you can find the flyer for my shows this weekend, Cobb's Comedy Club in San Francisco. I'll be there Thursday through Sunday. And don't forget that this Friday, the movie trivia schmodown, JTE versus Makuga, Little Evil versus the guy that always stumbles himself into fortune and fame. It's going to be an epic clash. Check it out on Friday right here at Collider Video. Josh Maguga the guy who defines the term falling ass backwards into success. <laughs> Sitting right there on the end, Mr. Jeremy Judge. Jeremy, it's been a pleasure having you on Movie Talk the last couple of days, but you're also going to be on Heroes later today, and you're going to be on Jedi Council tomorrow. But where can people find you normally? Yes, I am. Everything you just said, uh, at Jeremy Johns on uh, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Real Jeremy Johns for Facebook because someone took Jeremy Johns. I'm coming for you. I'm still trying to find you. <laughs> I will be there. But... Uh, sitting back there in her own New York style loft apartment, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And of course, Miss Wendy Lee, who I forgot to point out yesterday. Wendy, <laughs> where can people find you? John, you're fired, and you can find me <laughs> looking for a new boss um, on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you guys can find me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply I'm John Campia. And make sure you check out Comic Con HQ, shows done by me and John Schnepp, our show, Film HQ, Mark Hamill, Nathan Fillion, and, and Andy Tuck. Lots of shows over there. Check out Comic Con HQ. So that'll do it for us, guys. Special thanks to everybody behind the scenes for making this show happen. And a special thanks to you, wonderful people. We'll see you again next time. My name's John Campion. Until then, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.